So hello and welcome to the Action Coach Business Spotlight. I'm Lorna McAtee and along with my husband, John Boggess, we run Action Coach Cambridge. So what do we do? Well, we help business owners across the Cambridge region. And today I am delighted to have with me uh, Philip Ashworth, uh, PhD and uh, COO of Patient uh, Source. So Phil, it's lovely having you here with us today. Welcome. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, it's lovely to be here and um, we've just had a nice little chat off camera ahead of this so I, I'd love to share with everybody who's watching some of the things we've been talking about so where would you like me to start Lorna? Well listen why don't you why don't you start with where you are now with Patient Source? What, sure what, is, it that, what um, is it that you do? Tell us all about it, give us the background. Yeah so Patient Source is at its heart it's an electronic record system um, but when we set out to build it, we took a different approach. It was the first cloud-based electronic patient record system in the UK. So we actually had the first patient records in UK data centers in the cloud um, back in 2016 when we ran our first pilot. Now, from there till now, what we've really focused on, and even back to the inception of the idea, is clinical usability. So unlike a lot of software packages where you might have a developer design uh, a tool that performs a function. Our company is led by Dr. Michael Brooks, who is our chief medical officer and a still practicing a &E doctor. So he literally came off a &E night shifts uh, on Monday and was feeling a bit tired, but made it into the office on Tuesday. <laughs> and um, he brings all those clinical insights into the way we work, the way we design the solution. And one of the things that really makes us different to other solutions out there is that we don't try to be one system to rule them all. What we try to be is a modular box of Lego. Patient source is highly configurable, um, modular. And what you can do is you can build clinical tools, clinical widgets from all the pieces in patient source for your purpose. And you could build something small or you can build something up to a full EPR. So unlike some of the other electronic patient records out there, you may have heard of EMIS and System 1. They work in the primary care sector. Patient source focuses predominantly in the secondary care and community care and also virtual wards. Um, we don't do it all in one big go. We don't say, right, we're going to put this in and you have to do everything on patient source. We come along, we say, what would help you get value from your data? And so the modular system as I mentioned before, you could use it as a, a full electronic patient record. But if you've already got one of those, you may be facing challenges with how you're getting value from the data within that. So I'll give you an example of that. Last year, um, we were introduced to a new customer by AWS. That's Amazon Web Services. They're based in Israel and they had a challenge. The Israeli government had procured um, an electronic patient record system. It was used across their hospitals. But the ophthalmologists in the largest hospital in, in Israel uh, were saying that they had data in the electronic patient record, then they had data in their other systems, their ophthalmology systems. Mm -hmm. Now, patient source has a technology under the hood that we call an elastic data structure. That allows us to adapt it, that modular nature, that configurable nature, to fit new types of data, new data structures that we haven't yet seen without having to do a huge amount of development work to build out new function for it. So having not been into ophthalmology before, we said, just throw the data at our system and we'll allow your consultants and your clinicians to define how they wish to view that data. So the challenge they had before was it was taking them six minutes out of their 10 minute appointment to get data from the patient record, from their ophthalmology systems, piece that together, build a timeline and understand what's going on with the patient. And now it takes six seconds. So that time from data wow. to decision has gone from six minutes down to six seconds. So that's a 98% reduction of that time lost, freeing up the clinician to spend time with the patient and discussing their care plan. So, I mean, that's a very clear and obvious benefit in terms of how you can get value from the data. I think what's really um, important to know here is that that's just one example of how you can apply this technology. Mm. So you can apply it to ophthalmology, you can apply it to virtual wards in the UK, where we're trying to ensure that patients who are 
at home. Um, we all have a preference to have treatment at home in our own comfort, um, can be managed appropriately, can yeah. be brought into hospital when appropriate. Um, and with the NHS under strain, there's resource constraints in how do you get clinicians out to see them? You need to be making sure you're speaking to the right patients at the right time. And we can help do that. So we have partnerships with other companies that uh, help us build early warning scores. So Sanome, for example, is one such partnership. They build combined biomarkers from the data we've got. So an example might be at the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability. We've got millions of data points, um, observational data points, and we're doing a joint study at the moment with them to examine that data and see if we can better understand what might have been a better early warning for when a patient was going to deteriorate. So in a hospital, I'll show you an observation chart. This is an old paper observation chart I've got here, and it looks something like this. I haven't put anything on this yet, but when you fill this out, you've got things like the respiration rate, um, oxygen level in the blood, temperature, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, and so on. In patient source, the display looks very, very similar to this. We've designed it such that when a clinician comes to it, the cognitive load on understanding the data is minimized. So if you've been using those paper forms before and you come into patient source, it's immediately obvious and intuitive as to what the data means when you look at it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is within this, there was calculation of what's called a new score. Now that's a national early warning score and they would essentially tot up a value for all the measurements and score at the bottom. So if you had a new score of zero, all your measurements are fine. If it's one or above, some of them are abnormal. So depending on how, how high that is, it gives a measure of how sick the patient is. Oh. Problem with this score is it's a very blunt tool. You've lost a lot of the information and the data that's been used to put it together. And it's great as a general tool for how sick a patient is, but it's not necessarily great as a predictor for specific conditions. So what Sanoma are doing is they're combining the biomarkers, the observation data points with all sorts of other pieces of information. Say, well, is there a way that we could have seen that this patient was having a respiratory tract infection or a urinary tract infection earlier than when it's been picked up otherwise? Yeah. So that's a really important piece because the earlier you can pick something up, the better the outcome for the patient. So obviously nobody wants to get sick. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can catch it before you get really sick, then it's 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 much better. But the health economic benefits also speak for themselves in that the recovery time and the cost to treat that patient will be much lower. If you can treat them at home, it's yeah. much cheaper than if you need to bring them in and fill a hospital bed while they have IV antibiotics for a couple of days. Yeah. So that's one of the obvious benefits there. Um, another example would be our e-prescribing modules where the e-prescribing looks exactly like a paper drug chart would. So when you're prescribing a drug, you've got a prescription form and you've got all the issuing um, details there. When you're filling it out on patient source, the layout is the same as it was on a paper chart, but you've got all that goodness, all those tools of cl clinical decision support under the hood. So if somebody is recorded as allergic to penicillin and I go and write a prescription for amoxicillin, it recognizes that that's a, a, a drug yeah. that's based on the class of drugs penicillins, and we'll raise the, the alert. Um, so all those clever things, but in a format that's useful and accessible to clinicians. Um, we talked earlier ahead of this call a little bit about what makes a good teacher. And it's about <laughs> helping people to relate to the material. It's about not telling somebody to learn something, but helping them understand it. And the easiest way to understand something is to relate to that material. And if they can see this, relate to it and use it intuitively, they're gonna get on with it and patients ultimately will be safer as a result. So that's that's really where we are today. Um, I'm happy to tell you a little bit, Lorna, about where, where the journey started, if that would be yeah, helpful. Do you know what? Absolutely, please do. <laughs> of course. So, I mean, where are we now? We're 2023. And I mentioned earlier that our first pilot was, it was actually around 2016. And prior to that, I had been, um, a researcher. I'd done my PhD here at the University of Cambridge and I'd become a fellow at Darwin College here. And uh, the other co-founder, Dr. Michael Brooks, who I mentioned is an A&E doctor, 
he had witnessed real patient harm as a result of the use of paper. And he thought, there's got to be a better way for this. And like me, he's a massive nerd, loves, loves um, you know, <laughs> technology and, and, and he can write code and, and all that sort of stuff. So he, he put together a very early prototype of what is now patient source. And we knew each other prior to um, his, his medical career uh, when we were both students in Cambridge through the university radio station, actually. And he knew that I'd um, been working on research, which was to do with medical imaging and medical technologies. And so he approached me with this early prototype and discussed it. And it was then in the pub, as these things tend to happen, that I made the decision to... Um, you know, embark on the the crazy journey of the startup world with Mike. And um, we went forward from there. But the story that he told me that was really powerful was one particular case of a patient who came to harm. Now, bear in mind that there are more computer systems available now in hospitals than, than there were then. Yeah. But it is far from um, perfect. There's a lot of paper in use. Um, even recently, I've seen this firsthand and I find it frustrating um, when I see a, a member of my family um, potentially coming to harm through something that's completely avoidable by technologies that we have available. And that really motivates me personally on my mission to make sure that we get the value from these tools into the hands of those that can really use them and deliver that value and improvement to care to the patients. But the story that Mike gave me back then was of a patient that came into the department with a suspected subarachnoid hemorrhage so that's a, a bleed in the lining of the brain and what they needed to do was um, scan scan the head to check whether there was actually a bleed there so the way you would do that is you do a ct scan with a contrast dye and it's a cerebral angiogram and you inject the dye through the arteries and you pass the catheter up and, and you inject the contrast dye agent and then you image it in real time and you see if it's if it's leaking out this contrast agent yeah so you record that the radiologist wrote the report on a piece of paper which was then put into the, the manila folder of notes and when the consultant came to do their ward round the piece of paper was missing there was essentially an empty paper clip there and um, the report oh. was gone now the radiologist was a locum i believe at the time and the digital system that they filmed it on was a bit like the old cctv camera systems where it would rotate the video recording and it was recorded over so oh, no. ultimately the decision was made that they had to perform the test again now with this test with any test where you're putting a catheter up through the arteries you've got a risk of dislodging black and creating turbulent flow all sorts of, all, all sorts of things which could result in an in injury to the patient now the patient was consented by Mike again and humored Mike in saying, well, just make sure you go through the same hole because I don't want extra holes in my leg, all these sorts of things. But unfortunately, the patient had a catastrophic stroke as a result of this repeat measurement. So this was an example of a life-changing injury purely down to the use of paper and a piece of paper going missing. Now, I'll let that sink in for a moment, because if you think about how avoidable that is these yeah. days, it staggers me that so many places are still struggling to bring in digital systems. When we as an innovative company know how we can help. And when recently a member of my family experienced something equally avoidable, it's it's hopefully apparent to you why we feel passionate about what we do as a company. And really that's what I wanted to share with your audience today is that by doing things in a modular and small piece by piece fashion, you don't need to take on a big scary project yeah. to bring in this value. You can do a small piece, you can improve a part here and rather than saying we need to do it all at once just start somewhere and that is the message that also came back from the cio of the royal hospital for neurodisability they've got 220 beds there 
they were our one of our first big clients and they'd had four failed electronic patient record system in deployments prior to bringing in patient source Gosh. that is because as an organization they didn't have the resources required to do a big transformational project which is what those it vendors were bringing in to try and do yeah what they needed was to be able to put in something and scale it out so the way patient source works is you can put in one module in one location and then you can scale up by increasing what you've got in that location so they started with e-prescribing and then they added on the case notes and then they added on the observation charts and the fluid balance charts and the the ward tracker views and all those things and they scaled out across the other wards so there was no one point in time where they needed hundreds of people managing a huge transformation project yeah they were able to bring about this change over time in a controlled minimized risk fashion and they were able to do it at a fraction of the cost of some of these other projects that are going on so where this really um, comes back to is that if an organization have got a digital ecosystem they might have an epr they might have a number of systems in place they don't need to wait for a big project budget to bring about improvements what they can do can start today they can bring in one piece to fix a problem here they don't need to worry about having a big mess of systems because what we yeah. focus on is the interoperability and the openness of data for that organization this is the patient and that organization's data it's not our data so we make that that data available for the organizations to use however they see fit and by doing that it means that they're not locked in to needing to build out a whole epr with just patient source yeah. if they like some of our modules they can use those if they like another vendor's modules for something else they can use those the key point about patient source is that we focus also on the interoperability aspect and like i mentioned before about in israel they had an epr and they had these other ophthalmology systems we weren't replacing any of those what we were doing was empowering them to get the value from the data that they already had from those systems so whilst we can go in and we can do the function of some of those systems we don't need to do that for them to get value from the data they can just surface it up through the patient source system and provide this information so i guess that tells the story as to where we've come from where we've been going to um i mentioned my research as a you know a medical um, physicist earlier on and um being able to do this with patient source and see the value that it can deliver to patients is is really rewarding yeah and you know it can be frustrating at times for the reasons i expressed in that there is perhaps more so in the medical industry than other industries inertia to change because there is a more understandably there is a more risk averse approach to change um but you know i'm, I'm i feel very very um what's the word i'm looking for very very lucky very fortunate to be able to work in a career that can bring about benefit for people mm. Which if i think back to when i was a child i've got a two year, uh, a four year old and a and a six year old i've got two kids and as i was mentioning to you lorna before the call they're very much into space right now and when i was a kid i really wanted to be an astronaut right <laughs> yeah and um that wasn't to be um you know <laughs> i my eyes aren't perfect and and all the rest of it but it was the fascination with technology and that wonder of discovery that really drove me to where i am today and being able to apply that sort of skill set in a way that can help people and benefit people is truly rewarding so for that i'm very grateful that mike came to me and and, and asked me to to co-found the company with him all all those years ago um because from then on i've been able to to apply those skills in such a way 
Do you know what, Phil? I, I, I really wasn't expecting the story that, that, that you just uh, you just told. And sadly, you hear too many of these types of stories. And that's why it's so important, um, you know, that the right technology is used. Um, you know, it's it, 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 it's too late to shut the door once the horse is bolted, um, unfortunately. Right. And it, it is quite hard hitting when you do hear these, you know, these these awful stories. Um, so so you've been going, Patient Source has been going since 2016. Um, you're based in Cambridge? We're based in Cambridge, uh, although our workforce is rather scattered. So we founded in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, the, the company actually founded uh, and incorporated back in 2012. Now, that was still when I was studying, Mike still doing medicine. We it was sort of almost a moonlighting project in the early days where we put together a prototype that we felt comfortable taking to investors. Mm -hmm. uh, many businesses will be familiar with this process of where you 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 build up your MVP and you, you, you get some funding. And then we brought in additional developers and we developed the product more to the point where we felt we were comfortable actually putting it in a clinical environment. Okay. Um, as I said, this you know this was a bit of moonlighting in the early days. So it was 2016 when we actually put it into James Paget in Great Yarmouth, um, okay. where we did our first pilot, and that was the pilot where we were the very first electronic patient record system in UK cloud infrastructure. Uh, that was on Microsoft's Azure data centers. Um, we were part of their private preview, and when they announced the new data centers, we switched on and we went live at James Paget that day. And um, that was our, our first success story. And then we're still in there. We're doing things with our ambulatory care. We're working on a number of other projects with them at the moment to expand that use there. Uh, we found because of the nature of the NHS and many of your um, viewers who perhaps have run their own businesses may find similar challenges in selling to a public organization like the NHS, um, both at the national level, but also at the, the regional level. Um, the integrated care systems locally. Um, we find that public sector is more risk averse than private sector uh, and can therefore be buried a little bit in bureaucracy. That's not to say it's not possible. You know, we've done it, but we're finding that we're making better headway as a small business into the private healthcare sector where they can see the value in what we're doing in treating the patient in that controlled setting. So they're smaller organizations, therefore it's easier to buy from an organization like us. And in that setting, they would buy typically a full EPR. They would buy the full EPR and they would go and put it in. If we're selling to the NHS, we typically would sell something smaller that they can gain value from because it's a much larger organization to try and do a big transformation project on. Yeah. So we're able to sell individual modules all the way up to a full EPR in due course should they wish to do so but we can start with something small to help solve a problem be that virtual wards be that understanding the the clinical importance and in, in the data that they already have but are prohibited by the time it takes to access that yeah yeah so, so how many people have you got in your team then phil so we're about 10 people at the moment okay. um, we all work remotely so we're based in cambridge headquarters is cambridge in uh, Water Beach, actually, um, oh, nice. is where we are. Um, but most of us work from home. We have a team here in Cambridge. We've got some down in Kent, one in Liverpool, um, some down in the Bournemouth and Dorset area. So we're scattered around, which which makes for good access to our customer base, who are also naturally scattered around. You all over the place, people yeah. are and people are <laughs> everywhere. So um, that works very well for us. OK, so thinking about the issues that you've overcome, I mean, you mentioned there about selling, um, you know, this to, um, you know, sort of massive national sort of institutions like the NHS. Would you say that that's been the biggest issue that you've overcome or have there been other ones? I think with any business, there is a journey mm. to be taken. And going from that first MVP and making that first sale, that, that is the biggest activation energy. Yeah. And in, in doing that first sale, you learn all those things that you need to do for that specific industry. And in our case, it was what specific compliance requirements there were, what were the information governance requirements, what was the cloud security requirements, all those pieces. Um, now, because our first pilot site was in the NHS, in some ways it was a baptism of fire, but in other ways it prepared us 
for the market going forward. We had everything we needed. So we would get um, our ISO 9001, 14001, uh, 27,001 um, uh, certifications. We get those, you know, cybersecurity essentials. All these things are, they take time. And as an entrepreneur, and again, as a massive geek like I am, I'm interested in the technology, right? I'm interested in how the technology can help people. Um, these other aspects are equally important for deploying that technology safely. Mm. Um, but when you set out on a journey as an entrepreneur, you're focused on the technology and you have to, what became very apparent um, in terms of um, an expectation management for myself was to understand that if I want to do that, I have to first get those pieces in. That's not to say you have to um, boil the ocean. You don't have to get every compliance under the sun to do it. But it is important to understand what compliance aspects you need to embark on something like this, because otherwise you'll start a project and the project will stall while you're then yeah. spending three months trying to get certification under one or another standard. And, and that can really be damaging to a business. So understanding that is really important. Yeah. I think it was we were fortunate in, in that it was challenging, but it wasn't a big challenge for us. Uh, we had the right people in the team at the time to take us on that journey. So we were prepared when we went in, but it's one of those things that I look back and I think if I was doing it on my own with the knowledge I had at the time, it could quite easily have been one of those things that I overlooked and had to deal with as they came along, which could yeah. really stall a project. And that's what um, anyone who's starting a new business might want to be aware of if they go into this space. Yeah, absolutely. Because you don't know what you don't know until you have to know it. That's right. Sure. So, so you know, you're talking about, um, you know, the 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 future. So, for patient source, Phil, what what's the future like? And you know, do you see any challenges that might get in your way? Well, there's. I'll answer that in two ways because there's a near term and a long term future here. And the near term, I'm thinking in terms of the economic and business landscape, what the opportunities are for us. Mm. Um, I've already mentioned we've got a number of um, international customers and domestic customers in the UK, at least uh, with the NHS under pressure, a lot of the elective care. So things like shoulder surgeries, knee replacements, those are all being contracted out where possible to private healthcare organizations. Yeah. Whereas a private business, those units can optimize how they deliver that care safely for the NHS. Now, many people don't realize this, um, but GP practices are private businesses. Um, they're private businesses, but they are funded by the NHS. So it's not too dissimilar to that model in some regards. It's just that these private organizations will also offer those procedures privately. You'd be able to pay for a knee replacement or a shoulder surgery should you need to, and if you want it faster. Um, that's where we play really nicely and growth of that part of the healthcare delivery model in the UK is a big opportunity for us. So I can see that being a large area. Um, one of the things that I think the, the sector needs to be aware of is many of the NHS trusts are trying to implement big EPR systems, um, such as Epic, for example, that went into Adam Brooks, they were their first UK site back in 2012, mm -hmm. um, but only now they're implementing it at some other sites. Those big systems are great at removing the problem of having data in silos, which is a challenge. But if we're contracting out care to other organizations, that problem is going to come back up. So one of the things we're really keen to address is by providing our services in that space, we can make the data accessible, both to the private organization but also in a format that they can report back so that when a patient goes from a private hospital back to an NHS hospital, let's say, for example, um, in the unfortunate, unfortunate scenario where a patient has a, an op operation and there's a complication, um, typically that complication might need to be managed within the acute setting at a hospital. That patient yeah. might end up in A&E. They might end up in a, a specialist ward. That's something that the private hospital can't deal with on site, they don't have the facility for that. They have facility for routine procedures. Yeah. But if the data from there isn't available in the acute 
setting, then there seems to be a risk that opportunities can be missed for treating that patient effectively if you don't have all the information. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that's something that I'm really conscious about at the moment and would like to see improved. Um, you know, we'll do everything we can to do that. It's just uh, yeah. one of those areas where you can't control the entire industry sector that you're in. You're, you're part of a, a moving current. So uh, we'll just position ourselves as best to solve that problem as we can. And yeah. um, that's where we stand on that one, I guess. But the other bigger picture, I think, if we look further into the future, Lorna, and we touched on it again prior to this call, was AI. Um, and I apologize, Lorna, because I've been talking to you for a while now because I, you couldn't stop me from talking so we could start our interview. Um, I was talking a lot about AI. I think lots of people who are watching will have um, learned a little bit about ChatGPT. If not, they've heard about it, I'm sure, by now. Um, these large language models, they show great promise in terms of helping us um, take some of the laborious tasks away from humans in order to empower us to do what we do best, which is use our subjective judgment in discussing things with a patient, um, understanding the patient's situation, their subjective situation, and then applying that time in the right way that we as humans can be effective. I, I compared it earlier to the industrial revolution, didn't I? And it was yeah. <laughs> that tools like ChatGPT, it is going to replace jobs, but not jobs that are necessarily going to be lost. It's going to replace jobs where the people doing those jobs will be empowered to work in a much greater capacity doing something else. So if, for example, I was um, working in marketing, I could use that system to draft up marketing materials and I could serve more clients mm. by doing that. I see the same potential in healthcare. And where as patient source, we've worked very hard to reduce that cognitive load to free up the clinician's time to spend with the patients. Yeah. I see tools like um, these large language models and other AI tools really empowering healthcare in due course. But of course, the journey to get there is going to come with bumps in the road. Yeah. There's what are the compliance issues? How do you test this? Um, in a personal capacity, I've been doing some uh, work on this myself and testing how well these models perform against standardized uh, clinic, clinician exams. And um, at, at the risk of um, putting noses out of joint of any clinicians watching, it, they are performing at a better pass mark than the average person that takes the GP's applied knowledge test, which granted is an, a, that's a multiple choice exam, um, which I as a non-clinician would really struggle to get more than 25%, let's say it's choice of four, four answers. Um, this thing is getting 85% while the average pass mark was about 73% from a human. Now, what that highlights to me is not that this is going to replace human doctors, but this can be a tool to allow the human doctors to do what they do best, which is actually see the patient, yeah. understand the patient, they're going to gain knowledge from speaking and understanding the patient. They can feed that into a system that can look at all sorts of corner cases and entertain all sorts of possibilities that the human brain doesn't have the capacity to do when, it's, when they're in a hurry. And doctors and nurses don't make mistakes because they want to hurt people. They make mistakes because they're under pressure. So if they overlook something, it's because they're under pressure or there's something wrong in the system that's yeah. led them down a path that causes an error. If you've got tools like this in there, you can relieve some of that pressure from the clinician. They can look at that. They can use their clinical judgment to say, that makes sense to me. That's something I hadn't thought of, but we should actually rule that out. And we should do this test to rule that out. These are things that I think are going to really benefit the clinical world in due course. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds, uh, it's, it sounds really interesting and fascinating, but a little bit scary at the same time. I, th I think you're right. You know, I'd be lying if, if I wasn't a little bit scared, I, I think when I compare this to the industrial revolution with you earlier on, um, any new technology can be used for good and for bad that can cause harm. Yeah. Um, you know, the discovery of fire, for example, 
led to heat and light and all these great things we have, electricity, but it also led to the development of firearms. Yeah. Fire can burn a house down, it can and burn a forest. Whereas the Industrial Revolution, yes, it led to potentially harmful things such as global warming, um, mechanized warfare, all sorts of harmful things there. But it also led to the comfort and safety and extended, um, well, the ability to provide healthcare in the way we do now today. Mm. So there's a lot of good come out of it. The question that I think many people will want to see answered soon is, is general AI going to be like the industrial revolution where you need a human behind the wheel, so to speak, yeah. to do good or choose to cause harm? Or is it going to be like fire where it can do all this good, but it can on its own spread and cause harm? So it could cause a forest fire, it could burn a house down. So that's one of the things that is a scary concept in terms of what camp does this sit in? And are we going to be able to control this? Is it something that to do harm, you have to be proactive or to prevent harm, you have to be proactive? And that's that's the little bit that scares me is we don't understand that yet. Having said that, you look at the benefits we've had from fire and, and industry, I think they far outweigh the uh, the downsides. So as long as we go forward cautiously and we control the risks, I think there's something that's going to be world changing and um, bring about a lot of benefit for us. Gosh, it's it's yeah, it's, it's it's definitely really interesting. So, Phil, thinking thinking back, um, you know, your biggest learning sort of in business and life, what what would you say that they were? I think one of the biggest skills I've learned in business is the ability to remove emotion from the decision making process, and in that I mean relationships with co-founders relationships with clients relationships with employees all relationships um, can become strained when you have to make difficult decisions what i've found is the skill of removing the emotion from that allows you to focus on what the impassioned discussion might be about so for example if i have a disagreement with my co-founder it's not because he's attacking me personally it's because we're both impassioned with the same end goal, which is the success of what we're working on together. Yeah. If I'm having a disagreement within a team meeting with somebody, it's not because we're trying to shoot down each other's ideas. It's because we're impassioned to bring about the best result in the product for our customers and ultimately for patients. So <laughs> I, I encourage you know that people allow that sort of discussion to take place in a controlled way and the skill there is to really understand how to make the most of that passion among people to yeah. deliver value yeah absolutely um you know because sometimes tough decisions do have to be made but you know there needs to be an appreciation on on, on sort of how you do it and, and also you know that people understand it's not personal against them it's is about getting, you know, sort of the goal of, of you know, sort of what, what it is that you set out to achieve. So yeah. that, that that's really interesting. Phil. Was it I, th I think, I mean, on that point, just briefly, you know, if, if people feel they've got the freedom to speak their mind and you can encourage that, mm -hmm. sure, the risk is that confrontation. But as long as you can manage that, as long as that's um, controlled and manageable, that's when you get the best out of people. Absolutely. Allowing people to feel that their opinion is valued. Yeah. Even, even if it's in a um in a a debated um setting, you know, you can you can debate points and, and really discuss it and, and wrangle things out. As long as people feel they can speak their mind and you've got to create a forum for that, then you're going to get value out of people. Absolutely. I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Um what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? um don't have a tint in haircut um <laughs> but other than that i think really the advice i would give myself is do what you love because if you're doing what you love you're going to when you're working you're going to be delivering your best i find that 
the best work I produce is when my mind is interested in it. And it goes back to what we said earlier about learning. And when somebody, you know, a good teacher is somebody who uh, can help somebody understand rather than get somebody to learn something. Yeah. Um, you understand something when you relate to it and you can enjoy how you relate to it. Um, the same applies in patient source in our principles around somebody can enjoy using patient source, not because it's, you know, I don't know, bejeweled or, you know, um, some some mobile game that they're going to get addicted to. It's it's intuitive and it should be a tool that makes their life easier. A good yeah. tool is something that they don't notice they're using because it's just in the flow of what they do. So in patient source, it looks exactly like what they were doing, doing before. So they don't even yeah. need to think about it. Yeah. Um, whereas if you have to think about it, it's slowing you down. It's taking away brain function from the important jobs that you need to be doing. You shouldn't be clicking a mouse around a screen lots. You should be thinking about the patient. So we try and minimize that. Um, so it's all about that engagement with the brain function of learning, making things intuitive, and really fundamentally it comes down to doing things you enjoy. Absolutely. Do you know, it's, it, it's so true. Um, you know, you are going to get more out of something that you enjoy rather than something that you don't enjoy. I mean, it just kind of goes without saying. Um, listen, just before we we, we, we wrap up, um, Phil, is there anything else, you know, that, that we should know or anything else that you're working on or anything else that you just want to share? I mean, I think I've I've touched on a lot of things. Um, there's obviously we talked about the the partnership with Sanom a little bit earlier on, yeah. And how that discovery of new ways of using things. This is again a little bit touching on the AI side of uh, of the the question, and they they're using AI to discover new combined biomarkers, a bit like the National Early Warning Score. Unfortunately, because that's a blunt tool. It doesn't you lose a lot of information if you can create a whole set of those to give you early warnings for different things that can really empower it and that's really where i can see patient source growing rapidly in partnerships like that um and partnerships are key because if you're in a position where you're trying to boil the ocean you're going to do lots of things poorly whereas if you focus on what you're good at which is what we do that clinical usability, that elastic data structure, that's what we focus on. That's what we make great. Then we can get some great partnerships with people like Sanome, um, Alpha Lake AI, another great partnership we've got going on right now where they use, um, if you've come across Zapier, where you can automate actions between systems, um, Workato is another platform, which is more like Zapier for enterprise. So you could take HubSpot, for example, you could have um, a potential patient for a private organization enter their details into HubSpot as an inquiry. And when you begin the clinical journey with that patient, they might not be a patient at that point. They're just inquiring about a procedure. Yeah. When the clinician begins that discussion, that data can flow straight into patient source. And the way that works is that Alpha Lake AI have integrations to lots of different APIs and they create recipes. So somebody creates um, uh, a form in HubSpot, they enter their details, they say, right, I would like a consultation. That can then populate the basic details for a patient in patient source, saving the clinician's time and administrative time in entering those details again. Yeah. Getting data flowing and accessible everywhere is really key to breaking down the barriers that we see that, as I mentioned earlier, can be very frustrating when we know how much value there is to be had. Yeah, and also eliminating risk. I mean, it's an absolute no-brainer, no really, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Okay. So if people want to find out more or to ask about partnership, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you, Phil? Okay. Well, the easiest way is if you go onto our website, which is patientsource.co.uk. Um, you can fill in the web form there, or you can fill in the contact, um, the, the HubSpot contact chat, um, or you can even give us a call. Uh, there's a phone number on the website. Um you could even email me if you would like. And uh, Lorna, if you wanted to share um, email with any particular audience members that reach out, then um, you have my permission to do so. I think my, my email is already on the website anyway, but uh, if you'd like to add it to your details, I'd be more than happy. 
Oh, that'd be fantastic. And what I'll do, Phil, when I'm doing the write up the, that's going to go out with this video, I'll put your I'll put your details on there too. Um, so listen, I I could stay and talk to you all day. I mean, we 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 had a long chat before we hit the record button. Um, I think you're absolutely fascinating. Like I say, I I, I could stay here all day. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Phil, I've like I say, it, it, it really has been an absolute pleasure. It's been, it's been a pleasure for me as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take care.